can say is I love it when people lie about me. Anyway, um, I just wanted to thank you all for coming on behalf of the Board of Change. It's, um, it's great to see this kind of turnout. We actually, as you probably know, booked a smaller venue for this, not necessarily expecting that this kind of a topic would resonate. So I'm re really pleased to see the kind of turnout that, that we have uh, uh, today. A um, couple of thanks. I wanted to acknowledge some board members that are here, uh, Bertie Melanson, uh, Marco, Michael Barkuski, who I'll introduce in a few minutes, who's going to introduce you to our speaker. Um, how many of you are members of the Board of Change? About half of you? Great. Well, thanks for being members. For the other half, please consider becoming a member. Um, what we do is really quite uh, unique and, and different. Uh, we're creating and we're fostering a new model that values the pursuit of profit equally with uh, the pursuit of sustainability. And we're the only, only organization that's, that's doing this kind of thing. And, um, and you may ask, well, why are we doing it? Well, it's because we think business has a responsibility. And, and our manifestation of taking that responsibility forward is to express it through the Board of Change with the programs we have, the events we have, and uh, we hope to be announcing fairly soon some exciting programs that you can look forward to participating in next year. Um, we wouldn't be here were not for our, our partners, um, Elias at Strut Studios, who uh, very generously uh, helped host this event this evening. Um, our founding sponsor, Van City Savings, um, has been a tremendous supporter. And uh, just check out our website, borderchange.com. You can see all the, the individuals and companies that support our vision of, of what business should be and, and how we should be moving forward. Um, so, and, and you can join when you're on that website, too. So I'm going to introduce you to um, one of our newer board members, members Michael Barkuski, who um, has been of tremendous value to the Board of Change and who first introduced me to this topic of e ecological, um, the ecological economy. So I'm going to ask Michael to come up and say a few words and uh, to begin the, uh, the um, um, session this evening. Michael? Thanks very much, Sonny, and I hope, uh, in fact, that I, I know the second largest number of people here apart from Sonny, because uh, I think I know quite a lot of you, and it's not often the situation with a crowd this size that I would know so many of the people in the audience. Um, so my name, for anyone who doesn't know me, my name is Michael Barkuski. I've recently joined the, directors, the Board of Directors of the Board of Change, and I appreciate being asked to do that. And uh, my background is in economics and accounting, and on most NGOs that I'm when I get onto the board, they always ask me to be the treasurer. And I was delighted that the Board of Change already had a treasurer, and I don't have to do that there. Um, I'm also the secretary treasurer of the Canadian Society for Ecological Economics. Uh, I've just come back from the CANSI conference in Toronto, which was an inspiring event with uh, good participation and some excellent papers and some interesting new developments going on, particularly from the more establishment side. Somebody uh, from the C.D. Howe Institute came and presented a paper which I found quite encouraging, even though I don't think they're, they're ready for the, the audacious goals that we all have that I'm going to put in front of you tonight. Um, they're uh, very much facing in the right direction, and, uh, and that's very encouraging. Uh, and they're people who I think will, will be influential in, in taking the, the big ship of economic state in the right direction. So um, I'm also, as some of you know, involved in, in grassroots efforts at ecological economics education in Vancouver with my chief co-conspirators, Randy Chatterjee and Jordan Boba, who are both in the audience tonight. Um, we are planning also to, with the Board of Change, the Board of Change has come on board as a co-sponsor of that with Village Vancouver, and Board of Change will probably be launching a ecological managerial economics course in, in January, that's on the drawing board. So um, we look forward to engaging with those of you, whether your focus is on more on the public policy side or more on the, the uh, managerial side of sustainable management, uh, there'll be offerings for, for, for whatever the taste is and whatever the need is, and looking forward to, to getting that going. We are also, in order to create a more permanent and independent home for our educational efforts, are planning to launch something called the Pacific Institute for Ecological Economics, which or ecological economies. Uh, we're just in the process of drafting bylaws, and uh, that organization will work very closely with the Board of Change and with Village Vancouver and uh, other NGOs like that to make sure that, uh, that we come on strong in this area. 
in the next little while. So that's about enough from me. I'm over to, to introducing uh, Dan O'Neill, our speaker for tonight. Dan uh, is Canadian originally, although he teaches in the UK. Um, uh, he graduated, got his bachelor's degree at the University of Victoria in, in physics. He then studied environmental science at uh, environmental studies at uh, Dalhousie University, which has become a bit of a center for good work in that field uh, out on the in Atlantic Canada. And then went to Leeds in the UK, where he did a PhD in ecological economics, and is now has an appointment at Leeds uh, in a group there that is uh, that is researching and teaching ecological economics. Uh, Dan has um, recently written a book with Rob Dietz, uh, who is a colleague of his in the Center for the Advancement of the Steady State Economy, which is kind of an advocacy, ag advocacy group for the steady state economy. And uh, Dan also has been appointed the chief economist for, the, for CASI. Uh, so he's doing a lot of very interesting stuff in, uh, in Leeds. And uh, it sounds like some of the grassroots activity in Leeds is really quite parallel to the grassroots activity that's happening here. When I just found out about that this afternoon chatting to Dan, and it's very, very exciting. So I won't go on further. Dan will, will no doubt um, tell you more about himself in the course of telling you, sharing his ideas. Uh, I, I will just say that I understand that his, Dan's book, Enough is Enough, uh, which co there's a copy here and there's quite a bit of other material. Um, Dan's book is apparently selling very well, in part because I think there's a glowing recognition that standard economics is in a bit of a funk and a bit moribund. And it's not providing the answers people are expecting of it. So uh, you'll hear more, more about that. And we are hoping to have plenty of time for questions and discussion after, after Dan finishes. So without further ado, Dan O'Neill. Thank you, Michael and Sonny and everyone here. Um, it's very exciting for me, actually, to come here and to talk about the issues. I left Canada about six years ago to go to the UK to study and work in ecological economics and and stuff happening around steady state economics. And I, sometimes I think, well, why did I leave? Uh, because there's all this, this very interesting stuff happening. And it seems to be something of a, of a worldwide phenomenon that, that obviously with the global financial crisis, a lot of people have said, well, the current economics isn't, isn't working very well. What can we do differently? Um, and so that's really what I want to talk to you about tonight uh, is some of the work that we've, we've done in Leeds and in Europe in general on how to build a different type of economy. Um, and that's the sort of stuff which is, is described in, in Enough is Enough. So we have a basic problem, um, and that is that economic growth remains the primary policy goal of most governments. Uh, if GDP isn't increasing by 2 or 3 percent a year, then politicians start to panic, um, kind of like this guy here. Um, or maybe he's becoming very religious, um, praying to the gods of, of higher growth. But we know uh, from the ecosystem science that there's a fundamental conflict between economic growth and environmental protection. As the economy has grown, uh, the, the environment has become increasingly degraded. At the same time, though, we're finding that, that economic growth is no longer improving people's lives in wealthy nations, uh, like Canada, like the US, like the UK. And so for these reasons, I'm going to argue that we need to make the transition to a different economic model, and I'm going to try and tell you what that would look like, the kind of changes we would need to actually make that happen. Now, central to this argument are two concepts, the concepts of more and enough. Now, more is certainly a good thing if you don't have enough. If you don't have enough food to eat, then more is obviously better. If the alarm wakes you up too early in the morning, then more sleep certainly would have been nice. Um, and if you didn't study enough to pass the exam, well, then maybe spending more time hitting the books would have been a good idea. But what about the times when you do have enough? Eating too much can lead to obesity. Uh, sleeping too much can be classified as a medical condition. And studying more or spending too much time working on these glorious PowerPoints, well, that could mean missing out on other important things in life. Now, the same general logic applies to the economy. We're at a stage now where we've had enough economic growth in wealthy nations and where more growth is beginning to become harmful. 
Now, I'm an economist. Uh, I'm an empirical economist. I like to look at, at lots of data. So I'm going to terrorize you with some, some data tonight, periodically, looking at some of the numbers. And I like to look at really long time series of data. So this is the longest one I could find. This is back to one common era, 2,000 years of the history of economic growth for the planet. Now, economic growth occurs when either the number of people in the economy increases, uh, human population here, or when the amount that each person consumes is measured, for instance, by per capita GDP, our main measure of economic progress, when that increases. Now, you can see that for the vast majority of human history, um, we didn't have a lot of economic growth. The global population and the amount that each of us consuming, uh, was consuming remained relatively constant. And that only really began to change a couple hundred years ago uh, with the Industrial Revolution, of course. And most of the growth in the global economy has happened. An increase by a factor of four from about one and a half billion people um, in 1900 to over seven, seven billion people now. Um, at the same time, per capita GDP increased from about $1,260 in today's dollars per person to about $7,600 per person as a global average. Um, now, that number, of course, seems low, but we have to remember that's, a, that's an average for the planet as a whole. That's taking wealthy countries like Canada, but also very poor countries in Africa. Um, but even so, from $1,260 to $7,600, that's a factor of six increase in average income, average um, average per capita GDP over the course of a century. Now, if we multiply these two numbers together, four times as many people consuming six times uh, as much stuff, we see that the global economy increased by a factor of, of over 24, 24 times over the course of about 100 years. This is a massive increase, as we can see here uh, from, the, from the two components, and we do have to ask ourselves, can this really continue uh, for another 100 years? Is this a model of development uh, which we can continue to, to follow? After all, the economy is a subsystem of the environment. So what do I mean by that? Well, simply that all of the inputs to the economy come from the environment, uh, and all of the wastes that we produce have to return to the environment. Now, as the economy grows, uh, we have to shovel in more resources, and we put out more wastes. But since we live on a finite planet, this one Earth, we know that we can't continue with this forever. There's an important study um, which some of you may have seen, done in 2009, which was published in the, in the journal Nature, um, that attempted to define the safe operating space for human beings on the planet. Now, the authors identified nine planetary boundaries related to key Earth system processes. Uh, things like uh, atmospheric, oh, they didn't do this one, sorry, chemical pollution, climate change, ocean acidification, ozone depletion, and so on. So they identified these planetary boundaries, and what they found is that we're currently exceeding the safe operating space for three of these things, for climate change, for the nitrogen cycle, um, and for biodiversity loss. And we're not so far off on a couple of the other ones, uh, such as ocean acidification and land systems change. Now, the authors of this relatively conservative paper issued quite a dire warning. They said that transgressing one or more of these planetary boundaries could lead to catastrophic change at the continental to global scale. And here we are, of course, transgressing three of them. Now, um, an argument which often pops up in conventional economics is that, okay, well, we know we have these limits, we know we have these environmental problems, but the solution to these things is technology or perhaps the shift to a more service-based economy. But this alone uh, can solve our problems. And so let's look at this. You know, can we decouple economic growth from resource use? And if we look at data over time, again, back to 1980 in this case, um, we get an interesting picture. We see that the material intensity of the global economy, uh, so this is the kilograms of biomass, minerals, fossil fuels, used to produce every dollar of GDP in the economy. This has decreased remarkably over this time by 33% um, over a 27, 28-year time period. The problem is, at the same time, the scale of economic activity has increased by 140%. Uh, if we multiply these factors together, we see that the material use of the economy has increased by about 60%. This is the total material use, all of the biomass, minerals, fossil fuels that we use on the planet. Um, now, this is not to say 
that this is an, an impossible task to decouple, decouple economic growth um, from resource use. But it's clearly very difficult, and it's something we've been uh, simply unsuccessful at so far. And there are reasons for this. There are reasons why this is a very difficult thing to do. And one of these is something called the rebound effect. Now, this was first discussed by a guy called William Stanley Jevons back in 1865. He wrote a book called The Coal Question. And the basic idea of the, of the rebound effect is that we have new technologies that reduce resource use, but when they reduce resource use, they also tend to reduce costs. Um, this frees up money, because of course we're saving money through these, these resource savings, which we can then spend on additional consumption, which then tends to undermine the efficiency gains that we've had in the first place. Um, so an example here, um, the automobile industry is a good example. We've had uh, large improvements in the efficiency uh, of automobiles in terms of the amount of, of uh, fuel that they use, uh, the fuel used per mile traveled, for instance. And this means that the cost of driving has fallen as we're using less fuel. The problem is, though, that drivers may then simply drive further because of these lower operating costs, um, which undermines these efficiency savings. This is an example of what's called direct rebound. We can also have a more subtle effect called indirect rebound. If we save money on our cars, we might take that money, spend it on, on a holiday uh, to Spain, for instance. Um, and this could mean that at the end of the day, we're actually using even more resources than we were to begin with uh, through, this, through this resource savings. This is called backfire when this happens. Um, either way, because of the rebound effect, the, the material and energy savings that we, we think we're going to have often fail to materialize on paper. Now, um, at this point in the talk, I'd like to put in a cartoon because it starts to get pretty depressing otherwise, I think, when we're talking about all these environmental limits. And fortunately, I'm, I'm going to stop there on the environmental limits. Um, I don't know if you can read this, but uh, the, health, the profit, or, profit is going up, health of planet Earth is going down, and the fellow says, and to conclude, before the Earth collapses beneath the strain of man-made destruction, we will be able to make a great big profit from its few remaining resources. It's quite tough to This is a question. You know, we know that, that economic activity has environmental costs associated with it, but it also has benefits associated with it. And do those benefits, do those cancel out the costs? Do they outweigh those costs even? And we can start to look at this question in, in a number of different ways. Um, one of the ways we can do this is simply from survey data, of, of surveys of happiness and life satisfaction, for instance. In these surveys, people, people are asked, on a scale of 1 to 10, for instance, um, how happy are they? You know, 7 out of 10, let's say. Um, and if we look at these data over time, um, we find that although per capita GDP is more than tripled in many wealthy nations, including the US, UK, and Canada, um, people haven't really become any happier. Now, this has led a uh, Canadian ecological economist named uh, Peter Victor to remark, Americans have been more successful decoupling GDP from happiness than in decoupling it from material and energy. <laughs> Clearly, this is not the picture that we want. But the picture is more complicated than this, because if we look across countries, um, it's a bit different. We see that, that um, life satisfaction and happiness do tend to increase with income, but there seems to be a turning point. Um, somewhere around $20,000 per year on average. And beyond this, once people's basic needs are met, then additional income doesn't appear to buy additional happiness. But other things do, which is really interesting beyond this point. Other things become much more important to people's well-being, and this emerges from the survey data. Things like strong personal relationships, good health, safe communities, having a secure job, and not watching too much TV. So why is this? Why do we, why do we see this relationship break down? Um, one of the reasons simply has to do with what we measure, with economic growth, what this concept actually means. And we generally don't think about this. You know, we hear it on the news, GDP, economic growth, the economy is growing. This is a good thing, surely. But what is GDP? What is our main measure of progress? It's, it's, it's interesting and important to actually look at this. GDP is simply the total expenditure on all the final goods and services that are produced within the borders of a country within a year. So if I go out and I buy a beer, this contributes to GDP. 
If I buy a new bicycle, this contributes to GDP. If the government invests in education, this also contributes to GDP. All of these things are things that I think we would count as positives. The problem is, um, if there's an oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico and we have to pay to clean this up, this also contributes to, <coughs> pardon me, contributes to GDP. If um, more families go through divorce and incur costly legal fees, this contributes to GDP. War, crime, environmental destruction, all of these things contribute to GDP. <coughs> Our main uh, economic measuring stick doesn't, doesn't distinguish between costs and benefits, between good economic activity and bad economic activity. And at the same time, it leaves out a lot of things. It doesn't count household and volunteer work because no money changes hands uh, for these activities. Now, in figure, maybe someone would have tried to make a different kind of measure of, of economic progress. It does attempt to distinguish between costs and benefits. Um, and there's been a number of attempts to do this. One of them is called the Genuine Progress Indicator. Um, <clears throat> It uses the same basic accounting work as GDP, but it adds in the value of household and volunteer work, and it subtracts off the cost of crime, pollution, environmental disasters, and so on. Now, if we compare GDP, GPI, for industrialized countries like Canada and the US, we get a rather disturbing picture. We see again that while GDP per person is increased, uh, the GPI in most industrialized nations stops increasing sometime in the 1970s or early 80s. Um, these are data for the U.S. here. In the U.S., it pretty much flattened out. In some countries, it actually decreases. And so what does this mean? Well, it simply means that the costs of economic growth are beginning to, to balance or even exceed the benefits of economic growth in these countries. So it's as if we take a step forward, and then we simply take another step backwards, and we end up in the same place, all the while running up the level of resource use that we have uh, in the economy. Okay. So that's kind of some of the reasons why we might want to, to contemplate a different model. And again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bang you over the head with these because I'm more interested in talking about what this, this alternative model would look like and how it would work. Because I think that's the much more interesting question. Um, Countries like Canada, which are consuming resources at, at quite a high level, and we might even say an unsustainable level, well, before they can achieve this idea of a steady state economy, which I'm talking about, um, they may have to reduce the resource use, uh, go through a process of degrowth. And there's been a lot of interest uh, in this concept of degrowth, particularly in Europe within the last five, uh, six, seven years. Um, I'm more interested in the, in the sort of where do we end up kind of question. What does the economy look like? at a stabilized level of resource use, which is within ecological limits. But of course, uh, the process of actually reducing resource use is very important as well. Um, so we're stressing that this is, this is the picture for countries which are consuming too much, let's say, and probably for the, the global picture as well. Very different from the picture for developing countries, where we still have a level of resource use in many countries which is too low, and where we need to, to get resource use up to the level um, to meet people's basic needs. But here we are in Canada. Let's talk about uh, the picture for, for wealthy, developed uh, nations. So what is a steady state economy? Four basic ideas here. The first is a sustainable scale of the economy. And this simply means that energy and material flows are stabilized and kept within ecological limits. It also means having a stable population if we're going to do this, as well as a stable level of consumption. The second important characteristic is a fair distribution um, of income and wealth. In other words, having limits to inequality, some, you know, some attempt to make sure that the gap between the rich and the poor is not too great. And there's quite a strong social argument for doing this. Um, there was a book that was published a couple years ago called The Spirit Level, uh, which made quite a stir in the UK at least. Um, in this book, uh, the authors attempted to, to look at the factors that influenced a variety of health and social problems across societies. And what they found was that si societies with higher levels of income inequality had way more health and social problems, including increased crime, more mental illness, more teenage pregnancies, and a variety of other problems across those societies. Um, there's, also, there's also, though, a strong environmental argument still for reducing inequality. 
And the basic idea here is that with higher levels of consumption, um, or sorry, higher levels of inequality in general lead to more status competition in society. So if Michael goes out and buys a new BMW, then suddenly I want to go out and buy a new BMW, and this leads to us, to us all at the end of the day using more resources than we really need to satisfy our basic needs. So two, two different arguments for why inequality is very important here, both social and environmental. The third um, important characteristic is really um, something that, that neoclassical conventional economics focuses on a lot, and that's the efficient allocation of resources among competing interests in the economy. And this is something that markets are, are very good at, at least for certain types of goods and services. <clears throat> and there's still a very strong role for markets in a steady state economy, but we need to realize where markets work and where markets don't and use the power of markets appropriately. The fourth characteristic um, is a focus on high quality of life. Now to, to achieve this, we really need to shift our, our goal away from GDP as a measure of progress. I'm going to talk a bit more about this later. And towards the things that really matter to people, like health, happiness, leisure time, prosperity, feelings of community, and so on. And so really, in a steady state economy, the goal becomes better lives as opposed to more stuff. OK. Can we really do this? You know, um, It all sounds like some kind of hippie dream at this point, doesn't it? Um, but again, I'm going to bring up a Canadian example here from Peter Victor, who's built a, uh, a model of the Canadian economy attempting to test uh, various different scenarios to see if we can achieve a low growth or no growth economy in Canada and still achieve a variety of social and environmental outcomes. Um, so he's got this model. I'm not going to go into the technical details of the model here. I'll spare you uh, that torment. Um, <clears throat> but I will tell you he's shown it's possible to have full employment more leisure time to balance the budget, to reduce poverty to the lowest level it's ever been in Canada, um, and to reduce greenhouse gas emissions all without economic growth. Okay. But how do we do this, right? I'm still, I still haven't really told you anything about this, have I? Um, well, in 2010, we had a conference in Leeds uh, to try and answer this question. Over 250 economists, scientists, business leaders, NGO members, um, public officials and so on, contributed to this conference. And the result was a report called Enough is Enough, um, which Rob Dietz and I have expanded into the book, which we released this January. Uh, the book describes a number of policy changes which would be needed to achieve a steady state economy. And one of the interesting things achieve this different type of economy. And it makes sense if you think about it. But, um, but one of the things that I found really interesting about the conference is we had all these people coming from different perspectives, contributing their ideas on what we needed to do. Um, and it could have just been a giant mess. It could have been a whole bunch of, of policy proposals which were completely contradictory. But somehow out of this process emerged a blueprint of ideas which worked together, which were mutually supportive to create an economy in equilibrium. Um, and that still makes me very optimistic about this. Okay, I don't have time to go through all of the details, but I'm going to talk to you about seven basic changes that we, we need to do to achieve uh, this idea of a steady state economy. The first one um, is maybe the most obvious. It's simply to, to reduce, stabilize, limit resource use to be within ecological limits. Um, at the moment, we have very few controls on the use of resources, the emission of pollutants. We do have some successful examples, like the Montreal Protocol, which uh, limits ozone-depleting substances. Uh, and because of this, you know, the ozone layer is largely expected to recover by 2050. This is a great environmental success uh, by some measures. In the European Union, we also have the emissions trading scheme, which limits CO2 emissions. Uh, in Europe, there's, there's a lot of argument about how well that's actually working. But the basic idea here is that we need more and more policies like this uh, we need to impose strict caps on the use of fossil fuels, forests, and fisheries, as well as on the emission of pollutants, like CO2 emissions. These caps should be based on ecological criteria using the best science that we have available. Now, once we've set these caps, we can use economic instruments like cap and trade, cap and share, ecological tax reform to ensure that the caps are met. I'm not really going to say too much more about this because the economic tools are here. There are things that we, we know how to use, that we have experience using. Um, we just need to use them. 
I think where the picture is really more interesting um, in some ways is the social implications of doing this, of how do we deal with the consequences of stabilizing resource use. The actual process of stabilizing resource use, not so difficult. One thing that is perhaps kind of difficult though and very controversial is stabilizing population. Um, population is tied to very difficult topics like poverty, reproductive health, women's rights, immigration, religious beliefs, but we're still faced with a difficult reality and that is to live within ecological limits. Not only do we need to have smaller footprints, we also need to have fewer feet. Now, it's kind of a good news story here though, and that is the natural increase, the actual births minus deaths in the economy, um, or in many wealthy nations at least, um, is low, particularly in Europe, where there's actually no country um, in all of Europe which has a birth rate above the 2.1 children required to replace both parents. This should be a good thing. We should be breaking out the, the champagne and saying we've solved the population dilemma, in wealthy countries at least, um, and yet many wealthy nations are trying to encourage population growth due to fears about what an aging population could mean for social programs, for pensions, and so on. Um, the story in Canada is, is interesting and maybe a bit different. Um, in Canada, Canada has an immigration policy which admits immigrants for three basic reasons. To give protection to refugees, to reunite families, um, and to contribute to the growth of the economy. And of these three categories, I don't know if you can guess which is the biggest one in terms of, of who we admit into Canada. It's the last one. It's the economic one, which accounts for about 60% um, of immigrants to Canada. Now this has a, a good effect for Canada's economy in the sense that we are taking some of the brightest and wealthiest uh, people from around the world and admitting them to Canada, but in the process we're also taking some of those people away from developing nations where their skills um, are probably very valuable. So in a steady state economy, you know, we need to stabilize population. Uh, two different strategies, really. In wealthy countries, we could largely achieve this goal by bringing immigration and emigration into balance, but also by making efforts to reduce teenage pregnancies um, and by simply not trying to re-encourage population growth. In Italy, for instance, at the moment, there's a, a new policy which basically uh, gives financial incentives to women to have more children. And so in many cases in, in wealthy nations, we're, we basically managed to stabilize population without really doing anything, but now we're, we're putting all the economic incentives in the other direction to try and encourage population growth. Um, in poorer countries, the story is a bit different. Our best bet is probably to provide education, access to birth control, and equal rights for women. Now these are all things which are worth doing in and of themselves, even if we don't have the slightly strange goal of stabilizing population. Um, I told you I was going to give you some statistics. Here's another one. Uh, there's roughly 80 million unplanned pregnancies a year worldwide, um, which is basically the same number by which the global population is increasing, 79 million people a year. So that this means if we were able to provide access to family planning for all women worldwide, we'd largely be able to stabilize population. Okay. <clears throat> A third policy. Um, or area of policy, and that's limiting inequality. I've already said a little bit about this. Um, economic growth is often used as an excuse to avoid doing this, to avoid dealing with inequality or poverty. We have this notion that a rising tide lifts all boats, um, at least if you have a boat. There's a, there's a quote which I really like. It's, it's my favorite quote. Um, it's by Henry Wallach, who is a former governor of the Federal Reserve in the U.S. And he really just came out and, and laid his cards on the table here. He said, uh, he said, growth is a substitute for equality of income. So long as there is growth, there is hope. And that makes large income differentials tolerable. Growth is a substitute for equality of income. Well, if that's true, then equality of income is also a substitute for growth and a much more environmentally sustainable one at that. Now, of course, uh, in a steady state economy, we don't have this growth excuse anymore. We have to deal with the issue of the distribution of income and wealth explicitly. Um, there's a variety of ways that we could do this. Uh, my favorite one is, is what I think is the simplest one, and that's simply having a minimum and a maximum income across society. Um, so people are not able to earn below the minimum income and they're not able to earn above the maximum income. Now what's an appropriate range uh, for inequality? In the corporate sector, at the moment, the range from the top person to the bottom person is around 500 to 1 uh, in the FTSE 100 companies. Now, some 
Equality is probably good. It attracts people to the sectors where they're needed. It rewards people based on their contribution uh, to society, in theory at least. Um, but universities and the civil service function with a range of incomes of about 10 or 20 to 1. Plato in his laws for a new republic suggested it should be 4 to 1. We've obviously come a long ways since then. Um, we need to move towards a more equal society. Yes. So, the fourth one, and this is my favorite, um, this is generally very popular, um, is reducing working hours, and probably something I could stand to do. Um, currently, we use the benefits of technological progress to produce more stuff. What do I mean by this? Well, let's say I work in a cup factory, um, which is good because I could use some water, and it takes me eight hours in a day to produce a cup. This is why I don't work in a cup factory. This is why I'm an academic, clearly. Um, but one day, based on my academic education, I come up with a clever idea. I figure out how to make cups twice as quickly. Um, I think I'm good for water. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you, yes. <laughs> enough is enough, yes. I, I don't want too much With my, I, I innovate. I come up with a new idea. Now, does this mean I get to go home at noon? No. No, it means I produce twice as many cups. Been waiting for it. There we go. Um, and then our marketing department has to go out. They have to convince people to buy these extra cups. Maybe they come up with a new slogan, one cup is never enough. Um, <laughs> otherwise, I'm out of a job, right? Uh, the problem is, though, we can't keep ramp ramping up production simply to keep people employed which is largely what we're doing at the moment. You know, it didn't used to be this way. We used to need this additional production. Now we don't. Now we produce the additional stuff in many regards just to keep the economy functioning. Um, what we can do, though, is, is, is the blindingly obvious in some ways. We can use the benefits of technological progress uh, to shorten our working hours, to shorten the working day, the working week, the working year, the working career even. We can have the same salaries but more leisure time Sounds good to me. Um, again, just to throw another number at you, on average, labor productivity increases by about 2% a year in industrialized countries like Canada. If we applied these gains to increasing our free time instead of the amount of stuff we produce and consume, we could have a four-day working week in 12 years, a three-day working week in 25 years. Okay. The fifth one, <clears throat> and this is the most interesting, I think. And it's, it's the one which has been, by and large, completely neglected by people in my field until very recently. Until... We need to reform the monetary system. And now I was looking for an image that would really encapsulate the fractional reserve banking system that we have at the moment and why it's so bad. Um, and I stumbled upon what I, what I think you'll agree is, is, is a very good image here. Um, <laughs> it really, really sums it all up though, right? Um, <clears throat> Seriously though, we have a problem. Um, <clears throat> well, yes, and well, obviously, multiple problems. Um, the problem is that most of our money uh, is created by private banks in the form of loans. And again, this is one of these things where, where it didn't always used to be this way. It's just kind of evolved into this situation. If you ask the average person where they think money comes from, they probably say, the government, uh, the, Royal, the Royal, the Mint, uh, the Bank of Canada. Um, but the public agencies like the Mint, uh, like the Bank of Canada, only produce about 3% of our money. Uh, pretty much just the, the bills and the coins in circulation. The other 97% of our money is created by banks in the form of loans uh, and effectively enters electronic circulation in that way. So how does this work? Well, if I go into a bank um, and try and take out a mortgage, the bank will look at me, they'll say, aha, he's just published this wonderful book, we'll loan him the vast sum of, of $100,000, let's say. Um, now you'd figure that in order to loan me this money, the bank would actually have to have it. Um, after all, if I ask Michael uh, for $100,000, he can't just write something on a piece of paper and give it to me. He actually has to have that money in order for any of you to take it. Um, but that's not, how it, that's not how it works in the banking sector. Um, banks are allowed to create money out of thin air, 
and loan it to me because I promise that I'm going to pay it back. It's a, trip, a trick of double entry bookkeeping. So how does this work? Well, when a bank creates a loan, they create two things. They create an asset and a liability. Um, the liability is the, is the money that they've created and put in my account. Um, and the asset is the money that I then owe them, the loan contract saying I'm going to pay back um, this $100,000. Now, everything's OK, quote, quote, because these two numbers cancel out. But in the process, the amount of money in circulation has increased because I can then take that money, I can then go and, 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 and spend it on my BMW in order to keep up with Michael, um, and everyone's happy, right? But the problem is I then have to go out into the real economy and I have to, I have to pay this loan back, right? Um, I have to earn money um, generating economic activity, using resources, and so on. But it's not just the loan I have to pay back, I have to pay back interest on this loan as well. Now, if everyone is doing this, which by and large they are in our economies, then the total amount of money has to increase over time. And where does this additional money come from? Anyone? Where? Labor resources, sorry? Inflation? Inflation? Where does the actual, where do the actual, where is the actual electronic? Uh, as it were, or the, the bills in circulation, where do these things come from? Mm -hmm. The bank creates more. Yes. More loans, right? It's, just, it's the same place the rest of our money comes from, the only place it can come from. For the system to function, the total amount of debt has to increase over time. And this is exactly what's happened. You go back to 1950, uh, debt increased in the US and Canada by 8, 9 percent a year. Uh, up until the financial crisis, when the little house of cards came crashing down. Um, and now it's, it's increasing again at a furious rate. Um, you know, it's a bit like using your visa to pay off your MasterCard, the way the system works. You're using one set of loans to pay off another set of loans, you know, as a whole, as, over the, the entire economy. Um, and this increasing debt creates a number of problems. It drives inflation, of course. Um, as you said, it increases resource use, and it causes the system to crash periodically when the level of debt becomes too high. Now, this is a ridiculous system. Um, even if your goal is not environmental sustainability, social equity, and so on. Uh, if your goal is these things, then it's even more ridiculous. Um, but the solution is again, is, again, blindingly simple. It's to prohibit banks from creating money out of thin air. Uh, after all, if I did what banks are doing, this is what would probably happen to me. We transfer the ability to create money to a public institution, the Bank of Canada, um, which would then transfer this money to the government to spend into existence. In such a system, we'd still have banks, of course, but they'd act as financial intermediaries. They'd only loan existing money. They would effectively function the way that most people think banks function, as taking savers' money and loaning it on to people who want to borrow that money which is not how the system works at all at the moment. You do not need to deposit money in the bank for the bank to loan that money. In fact, if you look at the economic data, it actually works the other way around. Loans are the things which create deposits in the end, not deposits creating loans. Anyhow, there's a very simple solution which would prevent anything like the recent financial crisis from happening again, but it's difficult to implement, of course, because banks make a pretty good deal off of the current arrangement. Uh, banks can create money, they can loan it, um, they then get the money and the interest back, and they, the, the money which they created is destroyed in the process, but they get to keep the interest. Um, so it's a very, good, a very good way to make money, um, and you can see why banks would be quite reluctant uh, to see these kinds of changes happen. Sixth thing we need to do is really to rethink the way that businesses create value. Um, Currently, the dominant type of business that we have um, is the shareholder-owned corporation. Uh, if you rank nations by GDP and corporations by revenue, you find that 48 out of the top 100 economies in the world are corporations. And a key feature of the corporation is that it's legally bound to maximize returns for its shareholders and interest that it needs to put above all others. And this was famously demonstrated by Henry Ford back in 1918, who ran up against this. Uh, Ford had declared that he wanted to employ still more men to spread the benefits of the industrial system to the greatest number of people to help them build up their lives and their homes instead of paying increased returns uh, to shareholders. 
a noble goal, but it didn't happen. A court order forced uh, the Ford company to pay the money to shareholders rather than reinvest it as Ford had wanted. And the situation we have, by and large, is that businesses have become trapped in an overly narrow um, approach to value creation that emphasizes short-term profits and ignores people's real needs. Now, in a steady-state economy, businesses really need to expand their conception of value to move beyond simply generating financial returns, but also to generate environmental and social returns. And this is happening. And again, this is really interesting. Um, and my, my knowledge here, unfortunately, is very much limited to what's happening in the UK. So when we, when we talk afterwards, I'd really like to hear what's happening in Canada. But we now have many, many firms in the UK, social enterprises, who are doing this. Um, this is a few of them up here. Um, the big issue uh, is an interesting newspaper which effectively tries to raise money for, for homeless individuals by the sale of this magazine. Uh, we have various different consumer products from chocolate bars to, to, to coffee. We have a, sort of a, um, a botanical garden called the Eden Project. We have John Lewis, which is a major, uh, major supermarket and department store in the UK. All of these are effectively social enterprises. And a steady state economy would see and need more types of social enterprises to emerge. And we can help in this transition by promoting alternative legal structures beyond the shareholder operation, uh, which allow businesses to prioritize environmental and social uh, returns, um, while still pursuing profit as a secondary motive. And so in the UK, we have something called the Community Interest Company, uh, which was created in 2004, which is a legal structure which requires uh, businesses to have a social and environmental aim as their first objective, uh, but also to have profit-making as a secondary objective. And it basically means that the companies um, can only take 35% uh, of the revenues um, in terms of, of redistributing these to, sh uh, to shareholders as profits, and the other revenues have to be reinvested in social and environmental objectives. And there's been a huge growth in the number of these. There's over 10,000 of these, these, uh, these firms have been created over the past nine years in the UK. Um, and so again, I think this is very important and a very powerful driver of change towards a more sustainable economy. The seventh and final thing we need to do um, and this is an area that I, I really I am engaged in research in uh, quite a bit, and that's changing the way that we measure progress. I've already said currently we rely on GDP, which is a, is a poor measure of progress because it doesn't distinguish between benefits and costs, between the quality and quantity of economic activity. The cleanup cost for the BP disaster in the Gulf of Mexico has been estimated to be over $40 billion. Um, according to the Wall Street Journal, the disaster actually boosted GDP. Although 3,000 jobs were lost during the moratorium on oil uh, drilling, 4,000 jobs were created cleaning up the mess. We came out ahead, by the conventional measures at least. Um, we need better measures of progress. In a steady state economy, uh, we need two sets of measures of progress. I think. Uh, we replace GDP with two sets of accounts. First is of human well-being, such as health, happiness, employment, equality, social capital. These are the things that we want to increase, to maximize in society. And at the same time, we have measures of resource use, uh, such as material flows, ecological footprint, CO2 emissions. These are the things that we want to reduce, uh, to hold within ecological limits uh, in the economy. I should say, and I should stress, at this point, the steady state economy is not an economy where the goal is zero growth in GDP. As I've said, GDP is a poor measure of progress for a number of different reasons. A steady state economy is an economy where what happens to GDP no longer matters because we're focusing on other things, on the direct environmental consequences of our actions, on the social goals that we're trying to achieve. This whole culture of consumerism that's out there. Um, and I'm an economist. I primarily work on the economic tools to allow the transition to, to this type of economy. Um, but that's really only half the battle, isn't it? We're still faced um, with consumer culture. We live in a society that values consuming over doing, being, connecting. In the race for the latest and the greatest, we're chasing iPods, iPads, iPhones, plenty of other I wants. And yet the evidence is suggesting that this doesn't make us happy and it's trashing the planet. But what does make us happy, and again, there's, 
there's a lot to be learned from the, the research on behavioral economics on, and psychology. Um, what makes us happy is to connect with other people, to be physically active, to take notice of what's happening in the world, uh, to keep learning and to give. These things are the alternative to consumer culture. Now, we're nearing the end of, of our journey here, um, of the part where I'm standing up here speaking. Um, so I'd like to finish with a story about another journey, um, the Apollo 13 mission, which was intended to be the third landing on the moon. Now, many of you may have seen the movie. I quite like the movie starring Tom Hanks, uh, which was made about this remarkable story. Uh, an explosion in the oxygen tank damaged the spacecraft uh, on the way to the moon. The commander, James Lovell, famously radioed back to Earth, Houston, we have a problem. Um, their biggest problem wasn't running out of oxygen, but the gradual buildup of CO2 in the capsule. And the CO2 scrubbers they had were designed for another part of the spaceship and didn't work in the lunar capsule. Now, my favorite scene in the movie is when the engineers back in Houston, they pour out everything that they have uh, on, on, the, on the lunar capsule on the table, and they try and figure out um, how to solve this problem. They had limited materials and a limited amount of time to prevent the buildup of CO2 uh, in the capsule. Not so different from our own problems with climate change. However, they found a solution as you'll know if you've seen the movie, um, essentially banging a square peg into a round hole and the astronauts returned home safely. It's an example of creativity and innovation driven by limits of what we can do in a resource-constrained world um, on our own spaceship, the Earth. At the moment, we're making decisions based on whether they're good for growth or good for productivity, not whether they're good for people or the planet. We have forgotten that growth is just one means to an end and not an end in itself. But once we let go of our obsession with GDP, we can focus on what really matters, the health of our societies and the environmental systems that contain them. Imagine an economy founded on fairness. Imagine an economy that uses resources wisely. Imagine taking action to begin this transition. One thing's for certain, change will only occur when we recognize that enough is enough. Thank you. Back over to you, Michael, here. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dan. That was, that was really, really, very, very good. Very, very good. Um, I think we can, we could, uh, I really want to ask you, perhaps, whether you'd like to take a moment or two to, to just get up, move around, and come back, and st or whether we want to go straight into questions uh, to Dan. But um, I don't want to limit it only to questions, but let's perhaps get questions out of the way first and comments come a little bit later so that we can, we certainly don't leave people with unanswered questions because uh, some of us want to weigh in and have a whole lot to say. So, so can I first of all take a straw poll on whether to take a break now or to go straight into questions? For those in favor of a break now? No. <laughs> okay. Those in favor of straight into questions seem to be the rest of us. Yeah. Okay. So um, can somebody maybe help me spot? I wouldn't mind having someone up here just... But I know I think that's the first question. So go ahead. If, if coming up to the mic is necessary, please do so. But if you think you can project your voice, then go ahead. I think I can project the voice. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you, Dan, for your presentation. I've been curious if you can think of any national economy or regional economy that is already taking steps towards the solid state economy that you're envisioning. And in my own mind, I'm picking it up probably more by accident than design. We have the case of Japan. Mm. Yes, I guess I have a short answer and a long answer to this question. Um, there's Bhutan, uh, which is another interesting economy because they have as their national goal gross national happiness um, as opposed to GDP. And this, this goal goes back into the 70s, I think, but it's something they've really only begun to operationalize in recent years with a different set of measures of, of sort of human capabilities um, and so on, which include a variety of things beyond sort of the economic sphere. Um, but, but interestingly, so I, I guess I'm, I'm quite involved in work to measure how close different countries are to the idea of a steady state economy. And so I can give you a very long answer to this because um, over the past four years, I've been attempting to quantify how close different countries are to this goal with a set of, of indicators, which I call the steady state economy accounts. Um, 
if you can think of a more media savvy name for it, let me know. But it's basically a set of environmental indicators on the bottom here, um, which are attempting to measure the stability of things like resource use, CO2 emissions, energy use, and so on, as well as things like human population, built capital. The goal of these, you know, we're trying to stabilize these things, and we're trying to get the bottom guys within ecological limits. And while we're doing that, we want to not be destroying what's happening uh, to society. You know, we still want to have people employed, we want to have people living healthy, meaningful lives, strong social capital, high human well-being, and so on. And so I've applied these indicators to 180 different countries, and um, this slide is too long to go through, but uh, Japan comes out very well. In fact, Japan comes out better than any other country in the world in terms of the stabilization of its resource use. And so these little numbers here are the percentage rates of change of each of these quantities, which are very blocky for some reason, population, uh, built capital, material use, energy use, CO2 emissions, and so on. Where you see green, it means that countries have stabilized these things. Where you see red, it means that they're increasing by more than 1% a year. Where you see something resembling yellow, not yellow on this screen, um, you, see, you see countries which are degrowing. Um, 85% of countries in the world are growth economies. They're countries that uh, fall into this bottom category. Um, and so Japan is the only country which has managed to stabilize all of these biophysical indicators over the 10 year time period. Um, but that's only half of what it means to be a steady state economy. That's the stability part. Uh, this doesn't mean that Japan's resource use is within ecological limits, which is part B of a steady state economy. And we can try and measure that by using indicators like the ecological footprint um, or CO2 emissions. And if we do that, um, I'm overloading my color scheme here, but again, red is bad. Red means that the level of resource use is too high. Green means that it's sustainable by this particular measure. And yellow means that it's it's even lower than the sustainable threshold. And so the, the thing that you get is that most of the economies in the world which have stabilized their level of resource use have done so at a level which is too high to be sustainable uh, as measured by a couple different environmental indicators. Um, and so again, this is kind of an inadvertent uh, biophysical stability. Japan did not set out uh, to achieve a steady state economy. In fact, they're trying their damnedest uh, to get the economy growing again by going into debt and various other things. Um, but what comes out of this is, you know, Japan is obviously quite a good place to live. So are some of these other countries. Um, and so I was really interested to see, well, you know, are the countries which have managed to stabilize resource use in general, are these better or worse places to live than the ones where we're, we're growing resource use? Um, and if you believe Adam Smith, it'd be the ones where we're growing resource use. He said that the, the stable and the stationary is dull and boring and terrible, and it's only in the progressive state where things are growing that people are happy. Um, but this is, again, this is a very What we see um, is this interesting picture. So I've grouped countries into four groups. I've grouped them into countries where, uh, into groups where we, we have, most indicators are decreasing, most of the environmental ones, so we're, we're becoming more sustainable in a sense. In ones where we've stabilized resource and energy use, and to ones where it's growing. And there were so many of these that I split them into two groups. Uh, and then I look at all of these different social indicators for these four different groups. Um, so the first one, human well-being, is measured from subjective surveys and so on. Um, the countries with stable levels of resource use, people are happier after controlling for the actual, for the actual level of resource use in these countries. Very surprising. Um, they live longer. They're more democratic. They have lower levels of inequality. They have less poverty. <laughs> um, and the, the crazy thing about this, though, is, it, is that you know, there's this degrowth category as well. It seems that growth and degrowth are statistically indistinct cases, um, at least in these guys here. It's stability versus particularly high levels of growth where you really see this, this difference. And now, here's the real kicker, um, unemployment. It doesn't matter. <laughs> the rate of growth, um, of resource use at least, um, nothing to do with the level of unemployment. I thought, okay, well what about if I do GDP? Same finding. 
Um, and I thought, okay, well, I'm treading on dangerous territory here because this is contradicting something known as Oaken's Law in, in economics, um, which is this relationship between the, the rate of growth um, and uh, the level of unemployment. And so um, this is Arthur Oaken, uh, who came up with Oaken's Law in the 1960s with his, his famous pipe. Um, and uh, I, th I thought, okay, well, Oaken's Law basically says that if there's a 3% increase um, in GDP, that this will result in a 1% decrease in the level of unemployment. So, you know, growth is good, right? Um, and I thought, well, I'll test this. Let's look at the United States where this, this, this came out of. Um, and, uh, you know, if you can read this chart here, so GDP changes. If GDP increases, um, GDP increasing this way, then the level of unemployment decreases. And wow, look how, look how closely correlated it is for the U.S. Uh, this is why we're so worried about a non-growing economy, right? But then I started looking at some other countries, um, particularly in Europe. And so in, in this case, it really is a 3% change in GDP drops unemployment by 1%. What about in France and the UK? Well, a 3% change in GDP only drops unemployment by about half a percent. And there's some countries, like Japan, where there's absolutely no statistical relationship at all. Same with Germany. Um, so this is why I get the of there being no relationship overall, because some countries have managed to decouple uh, the rate of growth from the level of unemployment, with particular policies which they've used. In Germany, it's working time uh, reduction. In uh, Japan, it's a different culture around business. At least that's my theory. Uh, and so clearly this is possible, and it leads support to an argument made by an ecological economist named Blake Alcott, who says that ultimately it's society, not the economy, which determines how many people are out of work. That was extremely long, a <laughs> long answer. I don't think I'll have as long an answer to any other question. <laughs> okay, uh, can I take Peter next? Yeah. Yeah, and so there's that, that sort of improvements in labor productivity, we'll, we'll call that. So we become more, we, it starts to take less labor time to do the same task because we have these new technologies and this is a sort of 2% sort of slowly creeping technological innovation um, that, that happens. Uh, and so that's a factor, right? It's, it's a very different factor from what I've described here is where, in a sense, where, where what's, the economy suddenly changes in a big way. GDP drops or increases due to a financial crisis or some other crisis and that throws people out of work because we're consuming less, for instance. Um, and so that's a different issue, uh, in a sense, from this technological innovation one. Um, and in some ways, the, the technological innovation one is, is easier to deal with because it's this sort of slow change. And if we took those gains and we you know, turned them into to gains in our free time, then we wouldn't have that, that issue. Uh, but you know, there's, there's complications around this because some industries are becoming uh, more productive faster than others. You know, in the resource extraction, for instance, we see big gains in, in labor productivity. But in the service sector, you know, in physiotherapy and teaching piano and so on, we see no gains in labor productivity because the actual human contact is the service there. If you decrease the amount of, of time, the contact time, you're decreasing the service by almost by definition, right? Um, so again, this has led some, some economists to argue, well, if we're serious about managing without growth, then you know, besides reducing, um, besides reducing our, our working time, another thing we can do is we can shift towards these these areas of the economy which are traditionally seen as being less productive, uh, which is the opposite of the way we do things at the moment. At the moment, we really try and maximize labor productivity, but uh, one of the things we argue in the book is we should try and optimize it. You know, we should try and have technology do the jobs that we don't want to do, but we shouldn't remove the work uh, which brings meaning to people's lives at the end of the day. Before I take the next question, I just uh, comment that that's kind of really a bizarre result that improving labor productivity and resource extraction, a sector where arguably we're not really adding any new wealth at all, we're just transforming it from the state we found it into the state where, we, where we're going to use it. And uh, we're able to do that with less and less labor. You, you really start to think there's a cart before the horse kind of economy going on here. Um, yeah, Jordan. Uh,
seeing any of those implemented anytime soon. And I'm wondering uh, what you see as the most promising micro-level measures that could be taken. For example, um, is there a role for cities? Is there a role for people, for, for businesses, to operate within almost a, uh, a deal or a steady state sort of paradigm while the larger economy is actually a, a growth-oriented economy? I think so. I hope so. And I think, again, business can be real leaders in this area. And at least in the UK, we're seeing that happening with, with social enterprise. Our political context is maybe not so different. Uh, we, sort of, we also have a conservative government in, in the UK, though it's a, it's a coalition government. Um, and again, and there's been this huge upswell of, 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 uh, of initiatives in terms of social enterprise and things like that. So I think that's a very powerful driver of change. But yeah, I, I also think at the, at the city level as well, um, in Manchester, in the UK, we have an initiative called Steady State Manchester, um, in some ways kind of related to transition towns, but different because it's very economically, face, economically facing. Um, and this is a local initiative which has been lobbying the, the council, the municipality, basically, to, to do these various steady state initiatives. And <coughs> from a British point of view, it's a real open question because you know, most of this kind of work on steady state economics focuses on national policy, the kinds of changes that need to happen at national policy. And so how um, things at the regional or city level fit into that, you know, it, it seems like in many ways that any kind of initiative which contributes to sustainability is going to contribute to these things, but um, exactly how those pieces fit together, I guess, is, is, harder, to, is harder to answer. Uh, in terms of political organization uh, and being elected by doing so, no, um, not yet. Uh, you know, there certainly are there are political parties. Uh, generally, the Green parties have quite a strong steady state manifesto, and at least in the UK, they do. Um, there are there are members in the UK again of 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 the major political parties who are quite strongly in support of a steady state economy. They tend to be the backbenchers as opposed to the to the ministers, but not always. Actually, the minister, the former minister for my There are some very interesting things happening politically, I'll, I'll say. So, uh, two examples. One in Austria. Uh, Austria has had two major growth in transition conferences over the past four years, I guess, um, both of which had involvement from, from uh, five ministries, including the, the Ministry of Finance, um, and very high, high level ministers there. And in Europe, you know, there's a, <clears throat> there's a feeling or an emergent feeling that the era of growth is, is perhaps coming to an end. And so even people in the political mainstream are beginning to say, well, you know, they may not buy into the environmental argument or the social in argument, but they may buy into the practical argument of, okay, we've got a problem on our hands here because the economy to is geared towards growth and it's not growing, so what do we do differently? Uh, and so I think that's why there's been quite, quite high-level interest in places like Austria in this, that government ministers bringing together groups of 500. Um, things haven't been going quite the way he hoped, and so he was looking for alternative economic policies. And so he convened um, kind of a summit in Paris at the National Assembly. This is the, the equivalent of, of in Parliament in Canada. I invited people such as myself uh, to speak about how do we manage an economy without growth? What, what's a socially innovative economy look, look like in the 21st century? And again, we were all quite, quite impressed that this actually happened because, again, the political landscape in the UK isn't at a point where David Cameron would sort of invite us to come and talk about this. But in France, it seems to be. In Austria, it seems to be. And so there is, it makes me optimistic in that sense, that there are mainstream politicians who are taking these things seriously. OK, really? Too early for a comment, yeah? <laughs> <laughs> Well, OK, we can have some bread. Michael, I have a question. Yeah, OK. So um, this is a fascinating talk. Thank you very much. Um, when I hear, for example, and I agree with most of what you're saying, I guess what my question is, how do we avoid sort of falling into the pitfalls of planned economies like communists, the mm -hmm. number of communist nations? Because they did have, in many ways, steady state economies that was guaranteed employment, et cetera, et cetera. So have you looked at that? Um, 
I'm going to assume you're working on that. Um, okay. Oh, he's a great one. Well, <laughs> yeah, yeah. He's pretty clever. Uh, uh, you have a slide that's sort of, again, okay. this question does tend to come up. Um, I mean, the, first, the first thing to say about this is that many of the socialist economies, the communist economies, were still growth economies. You know, they were just planned economies geared towards growth. Um, and so socialism in and of itself is not the answer to this, this environmental problem. Uh, you still have to have the right goal at the end of the day. Uh, maybe socialism can deal with some of the equity issues in a more effective way. Um, but can we have what I'm talking about, a steady state economy in a capitalist system? Um, and most people working on this would say yes. Uh, but there are some people, particularly from the degrowth perspective, who are quite skeptical that the two things can go together. But I am of the camp that we can do it. Um, you know, capitalism's an evolving system. What we call capitalism today is very different from 50 or 100 years ago. Um, and if we achieve the sorts of things like I've talked about, stabilizing resource use and some of these other, other goals, you know, we can still do this in a market-based economy. And so again, you know, what, what do we mean by capitalism? You know, to, to answer this question, I kind of have to think about what are the elements of the capitalist system? Uh, and here are some of them. Um, the, this is the most important one, the private ownership of, of the means of production and the ability to do with those means what you like. Um, we can purchase labor for money wages, Prices fluctuate according to supply and demand in competitive markets. You know, these are very important. You know, so far, none of these, uh, these are not a problem. Um, this is fine. These last two are maybe more problematic. Um, but again, you know, even with firms growing in order to survive, you can imagine a situation where some firms are growing, others are going out of business, the size of the total economy is still remaining the same. But there may be a sort of exertive pressure on the economy to grow if we have this. Um, the profit motive itself, this is something my students are working on at the moment. Um, again, there's kind of, there's sort of two pieces of this. There's the profit motive as being something which allows wealth to accumulate unfairly in society in some way. Um, on that front, I think we can deal with that simply through redistributive policies. Um, there is the more moralistic element about the profit motive. Is it compatible with social and environmental objectives? Again, I think social enterprises demonstrate that it is if handled in the right way, as long as we're not instituting a system where, where we have to put profit above environmental and social objectives, where we can, we can charter businesses to achieve social and environmental goals. I think that that's okay. Um, so that's the long answer. The short answer is that it's probably a system of interventionist capitalism a mixed capitalist system, which is basically what we have at the moment. We just need certain macro level controls, and within those controls, we allow the market and the system to, to do as it wants, basically. Yeah. Have we more or less exhausted the questions, or are we ready for comments? <laughs> um, okay. Questions, questions get priority still. So. Questions? The questions, the questions here, guess yeah. um, We are in Vancouver. Um, 160 years ago, we would have been sitting in a forest. of Vancouver, but people want to grow the city. This is the city of growth. You hear this all the time. There's so many people coming to Vancouver all the time. The lower mainland's going to grow. We need to get more people in here. So there's high rises slated for the whole city, major surges in population and all kinds of hubs and so on. Um, you know, but we have primary treatment sewage. We have a problem with waste. We have a problem with transportation. You know, it's, it's a problem. And, you know, people keep wanting to inject a lot of people. Well, there's all these people coming. What's the short, and I, probably not a short answer, but what's the short answer to tell people that this isn't sustainable, that you can't just assume people are just going to, they need to come, we need houses, we need to change everything. What do, you, what do you say to people? Well, I think it's the distinction between sort of more and better, isn't it? Uh, between growth and development. And so what I'm arguing for is what I would call development. It's sort of qualitative improvement of our lives as opposed to just growth, which is sort of more, more of the same in a way. And so that's the, the short answer is to point out that maybe some of these things are eroding quality of life. Um, before I, I moved to, um, to England, I worked for the Capital Regional District in Victoria uh, as a planner. Uh, and I worked on the regional growth strategy for the CRD, and, uh, which has now been renamed the Regional Sustainability Strategy. 
Um, but so, yeah, so there's a, there's a sort of linguistic trick here. Regional growth strategy doesn't mean um, that it was a strategy for growth in the region. It was a strategy for dealing with growth, uh, for how do, we, how do we manage the system, uh, which, is, which is, has these, these pressures on it, you know, primarily increasing population, and how do we still achieve our other goals in the region when faced with, with these changes. And so, you know, I was constantly um, up against the, the conflict between some of these, these issues, between having more people and trying to, to have a transport system which wasn't overloaded and for having environmental housing affordability, of course. That's a huge issue in, in sort of the lower mainland and, and Victoria as well. Um, and, you know, my eventual conclusion was that something needs to change at the higher economic level, that we, we are privileging growth. Any kind of growth is viewed as good, but some kinds of growth are problematic. And we'd hear this from residents in, in, um, in municipalities in Victoria who wouldn't want you know, X, Y, or Z being situated there or this additional development. They were happy with things the way they were. And within the, the council, or not the council so much in staff, you know, we'd, people would be a bit, um, you know, like, well, that's, they're just being, they're being silly, you know. We've got to have progress. We've got to have change. But, but, you know, these were people's genuine views. And so I think there are many people who, who look at growth in, in a different way in these regions. And so we need, to, we need to, to manage things for improving quality of life and not just having more stuff. Well, let's say you and I set up a company and it becomes the next EVA. Yeah. In a steady state economy, there would be a cap on our income. Yeah. That is not capital gains accruing to private owners. No. That's a cap on it, which means you're actually talking about a system which is outside the fundamental tenets of what you define as capitalism. Now, the important thing I think here is that company, if we set it up and we have a cap on our upper income, actually then operates as a modern day not for profit. That's exactly what it's doing. It's a not-for-profit requires money to be redistributed according to its constitutional aims. And if you have a cap on upper income and you're operating with well, ongoing you profit, still have, you still have profit, right? It's just constrained. Right. So the second point here is that you commonly, ecological economists, don't distinguish between two kinds of profit. The first is privatized profits versus redistributed profits. In a not-for-profit setting, you can make as much profit as you want, but it's not privatized. In a for-profit setting, you privatize profits. And so it's this loose like ambiguity mm. that gets thrown around always about profit without understanding that it's very different, and especially in terms of the model you're putting forward. Because a ratio model would, would involve a society where you would still have companies where people could make gazillions of dollars because the bottom income is paid at, you know, at a very high level, versus a top and bottom salary, which essentially, if you forget shareholder companies, operates in a not-for-profit legal structure. You're actually putting a cap on a salary each year, which is what not for profits do. Is it purely a semantic distinction? Or is Absolutely it not. It's a totally legal and business infrastructure um, uh, d distinction, which is which drives the And so again, part of this, uh, you know, one of the, Fran France has a interesting, uh, interesting things happening there, I suppose, and that they've actually t attempted to, I wouldn't say set a maximum income, but they've set a very high tax rate at the upper level, 75% or something over incomes of, of incomes over a million uh, euros a year. And this caused Gerard Depardieu uh, to become very upset and threatened to move to Belgium um, <laughs> because uh, he was earning 8 million euros a year or something like this uh, and said this is, this is terribly unfair. Uh, but this is one of the things that, that um, Hollande used to kind of unify the left. It was very strong popular support for this idea of a 75% tax rate at the upper level. Um, but the problem with this is it didn't do anything about capital gains, right? And so, and so some people, if you, you know, Gerard Depardieu is an actor, he's not, well, maybe he owns some company or something, but by and large, he's receiving an income as opposed to, 
investing and getting capital gains from that. And so there was no very high differential tax rate on, on capital gains. And so because of that, this is now being challenged in the courts in France as being unfair because it effectively is a tax rate on some people but not on others. And so in order to implement the kind of policy I'm talking about, you have to deal with capital gains as well and in some way treat it as income effectively or as a, you know, the part of it which is, is taken home um, by someone in a sense as income needs to be treated in the same way as income. And so I, I think if you do that and have these limits on income, then the system, it basically works. But you're right, you know, it, it, it effectively means that at the end of the day, a certain amount of, of the profits uh, are forced to be put back into the company or forced into some other area which, which is, is sort of towards... Well, well, it is, but it, but it is, but it isn't, right? Because we already do this to some degree. And so by, by that token, we're not living in a capitalist society at all. And so, again, where do we draw that line, I guess? Because we already, we already impose restrictions on people. We already impo impose taxes. And so uh, investors, entrepreneurs, the average person working, we're not allowed to keep 100% of our income, right? Some of that is clawed back to society, to the government. And so the system we're talking about is fundamentally no different from that. It's just setting these kind of hard caps um, at a different place. Um, but yeah, let's talk more about this because there's, it's a very interesting, a very interesting point. Yeah. Could we uh, okay. explore a little bit more your um, idea of dematerialization? Could you stand up and thank you? Thank uh, you. So I wondered if we could uh, explore a little bit more the idea of de dematerialization showed the graph of growing GDP and reducing material uh, and, and resource extraction. And I think a lot of us who are working on kind of the so-called green economy right now are focused on this, like how do we create wealth by being more efficient, uh, by, by living lifestyles that are, uh, that are greener, have less environmental impact. And your slide seems to um, discount that as, as kind of the wrong way to go and, and irrelevant because of the rebound effect. So I wondered if you could talk a little bit more about that and, and say, you know, under what conditions might that be actually a, a reasonable way forward? Yeah, good question. Um, it's still very important. Uh, so my point here was not to say that, that we should not be trying to become more efficient, that we should not be innovating and designing lower carbon technologies or anything to that point. My, my point was that that in and of itself is not enough, um, <clears throat> that we have these other issues related to things like the rebound effect, which mean if, if that's our only strategy, uh, we're not going to be able to stabilize resource use while still you know, trying to grow the economy. And so the point is that, that, it's, uh, that it's important, that it's necessary, but not sufficient. I guess, in order to achieve a sustainable economy. Yeah. Can I just jump in here before I take, I've got one more question, Chris, next. But um, I think there's some really big questions here that I, and this is not a, a counsel I'm going to make of, of delaying and avoiding and do more research. We know what we're trying to achieve here. We've probably a high degree of consensus about what we're trying to achieve, but we do have to be careful with getting obsessed with a particular reform that's going to solve all the problems until we've explored all its implications. And I think some of these topics are very worthy subjects for, for a lot of study and debate over the next six months, or, but we're not going to solve them all tonight. So, uh, so, you know, I'm asking people to be generous in letting them go a bit, not because they're, they're not interesting and they don't deserve a lot more attention, but just because we need to give them a lot more time and there are a lot of pros and cons to be explored. So, Chris. Thank you. is that growth per se seems to be material, but why can it not be in the service economy, apart from the fact that the service economy tends to be highly materialistic, but some parts of it are not. Can we not have a growth in non-material wealth? Um, so I guess a couple of distinctions just to, just to, if I may, um, also, when you're talking about motivators, you seem to, to be talking about government doing it, mm -hmm. supported by the populace. Can we not engage social motivators to enable government to do things, rather than waiting for them to do stuff and 
blaming them for not doing it because we, we say we want to get richer and when we don't get poorer, we blame them. Yeah. It's I, very complicated. I think that's probably the only way of actually. Uh, I don't think government generally leads on these sort of things. Government responds uh, to the public, to things that are happening in society. Um, and so, yes, you know, it's kind of one of these things where many of the, the changes I've talked about are sort of things which are top down in the sense of legislation, but they're things which are only going to happen if there's some sort of push from the bottom up. And so I think we have to be meeting in the middle in that sense. Um, the service economy, a again, it's a sort of a similar issue to the decoupling resource uh, question in the sense that yes, you know, we should be trying to move towards um, aspects of the economy which are more service oriented, but we need to, to not forget that the service industries do have a strong, do have a material level behind them as well. You know, talking about Google or something like this, large server farms using vast amounts of energy. And so we tend to think of, of the services of being immaterial, but they're not completely immaterial. Um, they may have a lower material footprint from some of these other industries or, or, or occupations or whatnot, uh, but it's certainly not zero. And so again, we have to be careful not to put all of our eggs in that sort of service economy basket. Um, there's also the notion, again, it comes back to this idea of development versus growth uh, in terms of what we're producing and valuing in society. And yes, uh, sort of a less material, less materialistic type of, um, of consumer culture or of culture, uh, I think is also very necessary and valuable in order to achieve that. We have to be able to, to, to engage with other people in less materialistic ways, I guess, that, that sort of to, to put it briefly. Um, yeah, I don't, does that answer your question or not? I'm not, I'm not sure that I've, I've, I've sort of skirted around the key question there. But as I say, remember, we're not going to solve all these questions tonight. We're just going to get, make our research program and our action yeah. program. But I think what you're saying is that if we differentiate the material part of the service economy, If there is a scale of that, then it can be compatible with an increase, maybe we're not going to use it anymore, but still an increase in GDP. So we don't have to yeah, have that's true. total money going through the economy be stable. It can go up, mm -hmm. but it has to go up correlated to non-material. It could, and this is why you know, this is why myself and others advocate not using GDP as a measure of the system because it just simply doesn't tell you at the end of the day. You know, GDP could be increasing uh, because of some of the things I discussed, because we have more oil spills that we're cleaning up or more environmental disasters or more crime, uh, or it could be going up because we have a service industry which is becoming increasingly less materialistic and which is gen uh, uh, generating high quality of life for people. We simply don't know from that measure, and so yes, we need to distinguish between development and growth. It seems that those social accounts and Yeah, and at the end of the day, if you had those kinds of accounts, you don't need GDP. You know, it's, it's information we don't actually need to manage the economy. It was developed as a measure during, uh, during the Great Depression and during World War II, particularly in World War II, as a way of maximizing wartime production. Uh, and it was very successful in that regard, and some people say it's one of the things that helped the Allies to, to win the war. Um, and we've just continued on effectively in a wartime economy ever since. Um, we have very different challenges that we're facing now in the 21st century uh, than in the last century, and we need indicators that match that. So I guess we have some options here. We can just carry on the discussion. We can take a break now. It is 7 o'clock, which is, I guess, typically the closing off time. Uh, we could also, uh, I think, Dan, are you in a great rush to leave? Um, Not a great rush. Okay. Um, <laughs> what I'm thinking is that we could sort of formally thank you and uh, formally make people feel they're not walking out on us if they need to go, but uh, continue the discussion a little more informally. Um, but maybe let's just take, uh, take two, two more people from the audience contributing in, with either a question or, or a comment. So.
politicians and policy makers and even someone who might become a Supreme Court judge who I heard talk of a few weeks ago are saying that we need, um, that we need the uh, fossil fuel development to pay for teachers and uh, service jobs like that. So um, is that just total bunk or, or how, how are they going to get paid when we have more people working in, in education and health? I'm not completely aware of the political context, but it does sound like some sort of bunk to me. Um, I don't quite see the relationship. Uh, again, money is a social contract, and so if we value these kinds of professions, then we can employ people to do them at the end of the day. Um, you know, fossil fuels are energy, they're resources. Do we need more energy uh, to power our schools? It doesn't seem like it. If you're looking at a... We sell them to China. <laughs> we to, so we sell the fossil fuel resources to China, and that gives us uh, some credits. Uh, which we can then use to pay teachers. It's, you know, it's, it, yeah, it doesn't really work like that uh, in the actual system underneath the hood. Um, <laughs> so again, it's one of these things where if we value these things in society, then we can pay for them, right? Uh, it, it simply means distributing the work probably in a different way. Sorry, I don't know if that's answered your question or if that's just too sort of brief an answer of it, but. Um. Just a quick one. The data analysis on the steady state economies and the graphs you put up in front here, is this in your book? And if it's not, um, where can we go to read it and find out more? Ah, yes. So, yes, the stuff that I threw up there at the very end is not in the book. That's since then. Uh, there are some academic papers on this, which I'm happy to refer you to. If you come visit me, I will, or I will give you information on them. Yes. Okay. So this, all right. Well, wasn't that great? <laughs> so as our tradition to uh, guests, we provide you a beautiful gift from uh, Saul, um, uh, Saul Good Gift Company. Ah. And uh, Saul's a good friend. Thank you very much. The, uh, from the board. And thank you very much for coming. My pleasure. My awesome. pleasure. Yeah. We've got a couple of announcements. Um, Alex is at the front. Can everybody hear me? No. Sorry. Sorry. Um, Alex is at the front. Alex is a volunteer, and Alex shows up at everything. And if we didn't have Alex, this wouldn't happen. So on your way out, if you could uh, pat Alex on the back, that would be awesome. And uh, our photographer, Jennifer Stranger, uh, shows up and takes great pictures and user, uh, jenniferstrangephotography.com. <laughs> and the last thing is next, uh, November 14th, we have Jim Fletcher, C3, at the uh, Weston Grand at 5.30, sunny, 5.30. Five o'clock. And go to the website. Uh, come over. It's uh, really cool stuff. Jim's a great speaker, and you'll really enjoy it. Thank you very much for coming. One other thing I didn't mention is that the film's being made in connection with Dan and Rob's book, which should be out shortly. Dan, you said it's, it runs how, about how long? Uh, oh, yeah. No, the film's yeah, 20 minutes. About 20 minutes, so a, a short film to really highlight and visualize these, uh, these concepts and to make them more accessible to people who don't have the patience to read what isn't, after all, really that thick a book. But uh, it does. Um, do you have, the, do you have yeah. copies of the book on for, available for sale? I don't have copies available for sale, but I've got, Michael, you've got the flyers, don't you? Have, yeah. Yeah, there's flyers for the book. It's distributed by Raincoast in Canada, and you should be able to get it at any bookstore. Um, if you're interested in that. But yeah, there'll be a film coming out in January to celebrate the one year anniversary of the book, which will be freely available online, uh, also called Enough is Enough. And if you're interested in the, the uh, being involved in the formation of the Pacific Institute for Ecological Economics, or if you're interested in getting involved in the courses that are running now, although most of them now are well underway, so you probably want to wait until they run again, or if you're interested in the managerial ecological economics to start in January, it would be a good idea to let me know. It doesn't have to be tonight, but uh, get hold of my email address and, and write me a note. Okay. So thanks very much for being here. <laughs>